I'll just give it a second because I can see now the attendees coming up online. Okay, let's give it a start, shall we? Um, perfect. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, greetings from London. Uh, today, I am delighted to host um, this uh, Center for Grand Strategy webinar on what is perhaps fast becoming one of the most topical questions um, in international security. Today, we're going to debate a fundamental element of contention that exists in world politics the matter related to the international order. Does it exist? Is it a chimera? Or as the author that is going to talk today uh, to us, an imagined lost world, as it were. Um, I am particularly de delighted because um, uh, today this webinar gives me an opportunity to welcome back um, a longtime friend um, with his latest publication, uh, Professor Patrick Porter, um, who needs no introduction. Uh, and certainly he's way too much of a gentleman to go for a sales speech, so I will do it. His latest book um, is now out, um, and it takes the title uh, from the webinar that we're having today, um, and it is very easy access already on sales in the UK and in June in the US. Um, and I'm joined to give Patrick a little bit of a grilling, I hope, uh, by Jennifer Lind, uh, another good old friend of War Studies uh, from the Dartmouth College. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for joining us today. Um, for all those who are uh, coming online and joining us for this conversation, uh, let me just uh, set up the ground rules. Um, uh, as you can see uh, at the bottom of your screens, we've got a Q&A uh, uh, space where you can type the questions uh, that you wanted to address uh, to the speaker and the commentator, um, or you can also use the chat that is um, on the right side of your Zoom screen. I will try, depending on time, to set them individually, but if time comes to a bit of a push, we'll try to group the questions uh, together. The speakers um, have agreed to have a 20, 20 minutes uh, for Patrick to introduce the main themes of the book. Uh, Jennifer will then uh, give us a bit of a response and reaction to the book, and from there, we'll open the floor and take more questions. So, without any further ado, um, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome. Well, thank you so much, Alessia. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, King's College London. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here from around the world. Uh, I think the one thing that unites us all is this is an awful time. And so why don't we start with a little holiday in our minds, in our hearts. I want to take you to Renaissance Florence. Uh, because it seems to me that the things we're debating today are really not new debates. They are old debates in new clothes. Um, the question of whether, of what the response should be to Donald Trump and to this new world we're going into, and the question of whether we can have a so-called liberal international order, sounds a lot like an argument that was raging in and around Italy in the 16th century. Um, started very much by one of my favorite people, Niccolo Machiavelli. And you'll recall that Machiavelli very controversially said that uh, in the world we actually live in, not the world we dread daydream about, to exercise power successfully, you can't be a good Christian, right? You can't be a good person and exercise power and sustain power because people generally are not good. And even the people that are good are insecure. And he didn't mean that therefore you abandon all morality, but he did say that in order to wield power wisely, you had to operate by a different morality, a reason of state. This was hugely enraging to another faction, what we might call the Christian universalists, who believed that actually you had to be a good Christian to rule well. And in fact, what they should do was reunite the world around a kind of Christian empire. And so this question in a way is coming back up again today, and that is, can the United States rule as a benevolent hegemon as it supposedly once did? 
can a hegemonic power domesticate the world to its values? Uh, and this, there's an echo of this uh, because the United States, after all, was founded as a republic to stand for something a little different with a concern for virtue and the security of its, its liberty and its free way of life. But that thou seems to be under threat. And the question is, what, what should America try to be in a world of constraint, in a world of plague and war and debt? Some people say that what it should do is to restore something, to restore a lost thing, a thing that was around allegedly until recently. And that is a liberal rules-based international order superintended by a great power that was not for the first time an empire, but what we might call a hegemon. Uh, and that that power should lead the democracies of the world in standing up to this terrible alternative, which is what they call authoritarianism, Russia, China, Putin, Z, North Korea, Iran, etc. But I don't think we should do that. And I want to start where Machiavelli started and when he made a very simple observation that, quote, many writers have dreamed up republics and kingdoms that bear no resemblance to experience. And America, it seems to me, is in its own Machiavellian moment where it needs to think about the present and the future better by reimagining the past. That in order to make smarter choices, in order to, um, to understand its true choices better, it needs a more a blunt and honest confrontation with its very mixed history. Um, in writing this book, I'm sort of trying to hold two thoughts together, which are hard to hold together, right? Um, that on the one hand, the American dominated world, the world since 1945, was clearly better than what came before. It might be better than what's coming. But the act of ordering the world, of world order, is intrinsically illiberal. It is rough work. It is coercive. It is hypocritical. Uh, sometimes it can be done prudently. Sometimes it can be done less prudently. Why does this matter? Because it seems to me that this question is coming up in 2020 and it's coming up quicker than we might have thought. Uh, Joe Biden, who is the presumptive Democrat nominee, has said, along with a whole lot of other smart people, what we might call the foreign policy establishment, that the point is to restore something that's been lost. Uh, he said in his own words, America is coming back, back like we used to be, ethical, straight, telling the truth, supporting our allies, all those good things. In behind closed doors, he said to uh, Wall Street donors, that under a Biden presidency, there'll be nothing fundamentally new. It'll be going back to something. Now, we're used to people uh, in politics offering to take back control or make America great again. But it seems to me that there's also a liberal version of this nostalgia, if you like, almost a lost Camelot. And we hear versions of this at the big security summits at Munich and at Aspen and at Davos. I think this is dangerous. I think it disconnects the present from the past. It in a way, it's, it's a way of complaining about what has happened while letting the past off the hook, that the nightmare of, of dangerous demagogues, of dictators, of economic protectionism is a departure from what we had before, not a consequence of what we had before. And then you blame the voters or blame wicked populists or blame even people for becoming spoiled, as Madeleine Albright has done. But that seems to me to be evasive to avoid the underlying problem that a set of arrangements about economics, about the military power, about foreign policy is fundamentally implicated causally in what's gone wrong. So this nostalgia is not just ahistorical and curious, it's actually pernicious because it works as a kind of theology and gives us a bad guide to what's coming. I'll just give a quick idea of what the idea is and then I'll say what I think's wrong with it. So the idea itself, is that if we think of orders as hierarchies created by the strong, whether they're Byzantine or Chinese or Roman or British, the idea that the American order created in the wake of World War II was different. It was a liberal order that is organized around the principle of liberalism, the promise of emancipation from tyranny, 
the promise of openness and freedom and rules and regularity, that it was based on consent, that allies had voice opportunities. Uh, it was constrained and bound by law. Now, those who are in favor of this vision don't think it was perfect, and they agree that some and a lot of things went wrong, but they don't particularly want to talk about those things that went wrong other than anomalies. And they, it, it's a particular group of people who straddle both the academy and government, people who've been in and out of government and the academy. So John Eikenberry, Joseph Nye, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Samantha Power, Ivo Dalder, Gideon Rose, Mike Mazar. They tend to talk about the world as a choice between leadership, internationalism, and isolation. So the choice is the pursuit of primacy on this very moral basis, because their intentions are very good, or a return to the 1930s and isolationism and chaos and genocide even. So it's pretty dramatic stuff. And in fact, this vision draws coherence from what it is not, from this, this sort of the dark opposite, which is a world of aggression and imperialism and spheres of influence and empire, in fact. And it's interesting that this critique that they're making, in fact, that was, was dress rehearsed just over a decade ago in the long forgotten period of the Bush administration and the war on terror, right? Where people who now talk about how there used to be 70 years of the rules-based liberal international order, in fact, after 50 years, we're talking about had there been 50 years of it, but it was being violated by George W. Bush. So like a kind of medieval religious cult, they're updating the date of the end of the world all the time. Um, but this is not just an American thing, right? It's also a nostalgia that's played back by anxious allies, like the two countries where I have citizenship, Britain and the United States. In Britain, in the National Security Strategy of 2015, it, re it referred to the rules-based liberal international order 30 times. In the Australian Defence White Paper, 38 times, almost like a kind of incantation. And there's this anxiety there that they have a special relationship with a great and powerful friend who will come and rescue them. Now, I don't think I have to tell this audience how dangerous that assumption can be. So the antithesis to liberal order is what we might call imperial order. In fact, John Eikenberry put it very clearly. He said, the contradiction in the Bush foreign policy is that it offered the world a system in which America rules the world, but does not abide by rules. This is in effect empire. And actually, I agree with him. So it was. But that also, however, is a good description, I think, of US foreign policy since 1945. So there's this attempt to exceptionalize things which actually are much more continuous through history. Now, this is not primarily a complaint about the United States as an actor in the international system, right? It's an observation about the tragic nature of the international system itself and the bad choices that it throws up. In other words, we can't have liberal order easily if the world itself is an illiberal place. So it begs a lot of questions. Um, first of all, what do we do about the long record of illiberal behavior, right? Whether it's coups or election meddling or alliance coercion or agricultural tariffs, right? So if you want to uh, try and ask an Australian farmer or an African farmer about the era of free trade that Trump is dismantling, see if that passes the laugh test. There's also the whole region of Asia, which is often talked about now as part of the rules-based liberal international order, but it evolved that way as a lot of protectionist states under martial law. Um, there's the sheer violence of ordering, right? Uh, what Paul Chamberlain calls the bloodlands of the Cold War, from Indone the Indonesian anti-communist massacre to Vietnam to Korea, etc. cetera. Um, what about the almost routine recourse to economic coercion, what we call sanctions? And what are the boundaries of this thing, right? Was the order global? Was it confined to the Western Hemisphere or Australasia? Where does the Middle East fit? And if the Middle East, is not part of it, then why do commentators in the Washington Post and the New York Times insist that there must be military action brought to bear in the Middle East to protect the liberal rules-based order? So the boundaries seem to shift. Um, but this is also a question for countries like Britain. So some in Britain say that Britain's role is to enforce a rules-based order. Well, how come? Who says? Who gets to decide that they are the enforcer? Um, what if enforcing order involves breaking rules? For instance, uh, bombing, unilaterally bombing Syria to punish the use of chemical weapons, which may uphold one rule, one to do, but also violates 
a rule, a taboo, about only waging war with UN Security Council resolutions. Um, if Britain is to obey the law, obey the rules, then when is it giving back Diego Garcia? Um, isn't it also a problem that in order to win some of its wars, Britain has forged alliances with, with dictators um, who were rule breakers? For example, General Pinochet uh, of Chile, who helped Britain win in the Fal very close run Falklands War, would he have done so had he known that Britain would be dragging up him up before the Hague in the International Criminal Court decades later? So how do we get around these very necessary compromises that happen? More importantly, if there was a liberal order and if it was excellent, how do we explain its demise? How do we explain the change that seems to have happened here? Uh, if it's about Trump and Trumpism, then what do the Panama Papers tell us? What do the Afghanistan Papers tell us? This prehistory, it would seem, has a lot of darkness in it. And is there not a danger in the very notion of an indispensable wise superpower that sees further and orders the world? Is there not a danger in saying that anything that's anomalous is a departure from its essential goodness, that it couldn't that help actually produce further failures? So I think in the abstract, there are three principal problems, which I've sort of got at. One of which is that ordering and leading involves coercion. It involves demanding that others follow. Some of that, sometimes they want to, but sometimes they don't. And we can call that euphemistic things like primacy or leadership, but it involves the smack of government uh, and things like coercion all the way from Suez to economic warfare to routine drone strikes. Uh, in fact, if anything, a lot of the history that we've lived through, part of it is explained by resistance, not just enforcement. One of the reasons we haven't had a major war since 1945, I would argue, is that there's been something has happened that Washington didn't want to happen, which is nuclear proliferation, right? Secondly, there's this problem of rules, of regularity, that on the one hand, Washington helps design institutions and rules that it sincerely wants other states mostly to follow. But on the other hand, it, it reserves the rights to step outside those rules, to exempt itself, to exercise a privilege, not because it's bad, but because it wants to remain the hegemon, right? And, and to remain the hegemon, to remain the leader, you route around or reinvent or stretch rules or just simply violate them and don't talk much about it. It's rather ironic that when Barack Obama made his final phone call with Angela Merkel, talking about the importance of the rules-based order, well, well, that was the phone that the CIA, that, that was the phone, sorry, that the uh, U US intelligence had actually hacked, much to Germany's displeasure. Uh, and this, this is a problem because it's often not even talked about by advocates of rules-based order. So for example, uh, Richard Huss, uh, a grandee, of uh, the US foreign policy establishment, chair of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, former presidential advisor on Monday can tweet that the world should treat Russia as a rogue state for violating Westphalian norms of sovereignty in Crimea and Ukraine. And on Tuesday say that America should unilaterally support a coup in Venezuela, right? It's not, you don't have to have a PhD in international relations to see the problem here. And thirdly, there's a problem of security dilemma. And that is that even if we did have a great power that wanted to be a benevolent ruler of a liberal rules-based international order, even if we it sincerely wanted to do that and to abide by it, to adversaries and rivals with long histories of disaster and predation, like Iran, like Russia, like China, like North Korea, it looks too much like the accumulation of dangerous capabilities, right? It looks to them like one power acquiring for itself an overwhelming arsenal of weapons. And then it asks them to take that on trust. And even if they do mean it, even if you do have this pure intention, what if you change your intentions tomorrow or 10 years down the line, where does it leave your rivals? It leaves them endangered. So, in the, in, this, in the world that actually exists, there's actually an, an interesting paradox here historically that some of America's greatest diplomatic achievements, I would argue, involved a very conscious accommodation of illiberal forces, right? So 
rebuilding Germany and Japan into proud social democracies after World War II, which involved co-opting and collaborating with fascists, right? Uh, preventing Emperor Hirohito being put on trial, uh, even assisting and protecting from punishment uh, not former Nazi officials, etc. Uh, the opening to China in 1972, which helped realign the whole balance of the Cold War and make the whole Asia a more peaceful place, but that involved keeping quiet about the uh, genocide in Bangladesh uh, in order to have a third party intermediary in Pakistan. So for every Shanghai communique, there is a blood telegram. Uh, the Dayton Accords, which ended the war in the Balkans, in, locks in and freezes ethnic divisions. Paradoxically, at the same time, some of the biggest disasters, I would argue, have happened when the US has tried to transform regions in its own image with liberal means. The shock therapy in Russia with economic overnight transformation along free market lines that helps to produce this very predatory oligarchy that we're dealing with now in Moscow. Uh, the war in Iraq, which is, I would argue, intended to transform a whole region in America's image uh, in order to make America more secure. Uh, the prizing open of poor countries along the lines of the Washington consensus to promote free trade. So the very moments when Washington has become most entranced with an ideology of a crusader state, as Walter McDougall calls it, is when disaster most beckons. Um, there's a lot of other things to say and, and people are welcome to read those things, but I wanted to actually bring in something uh, to flatter and praise my interlocutor here, uh, Jennifer Lind, who wrote, a, I think, a, an article which hasn't been talked about enough in this edition of Foreign Affairs um, about how the US, Jennifer and Daryl Press, how the US can pragmatically adjust to a world of constraints. And one of the things they talk about is the need to, act, need to actually uh, recognize that you can't have it all. You can't go up against every authoritarian regime. There are greater constraints than before on America's wealth and power and influence. And therefore, it should try and accommodate these realities. And one of the things they recommend, which I really agree with, is that the US should at least try to have some kind of rapprochement, some entente with Russia that's reciprocal. For instance, Western non-expansion for Russian non-interference. Um, at least trying out the possibilities of a different kind of coexistence with one of its competitors. And what I try and argue in the book is that in order to deal with and contain intelligently a rising China, the US should do what some advocates of liberal order go against, which is actually disaggregate enemies and don't treat the world as an ideolo ideologized conflict of democracy and dictatorship. But in order to even debate those kinds of hard choices, those realistic choices, we have to move beyond the kind of potted histories and bedtime stories that these these panegyrics, these songs of praise leave us with, to think about the kinds of choices that have to be made. And moving beyond, if you like, talking about the world in a series of manifestos, uh, because uh, if the rest of us are to have restored one of the original visions of the United States, which is a, a great republic that's an example to the world, then it has to uh, think very clearly and very soberly, uh, as that article does, about the actual choices in front of it, rather than a kind of dream palace. Uh, in other words, we have to move beyond talking about history at high altitude, because as someone once said, the problem with high altitude from that vantage point is that everyone looks like ants. Uh, so I'll, on, that, on that rather morbid note, I'll shut up. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the exchange. Wonderful. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much. I think if I were to summarise what you, you suggested so far in the book, what you're saying is if we really want to keep um, an international liberal order, we need to accommodate with illiberal forces, which sounds almost like the ultimate contradiction. Um, and the three points you were making, the question of ordering uh, that comes with coercion, um, it's something that is imposing force on others. Um, that rules, if you want to have rules as part of this orderly sort of action, you cannot set some sort of uh, ability to step outside of them for yourself because you are the hegemon, because that raises all sorts of questions, which connects to the third point you were making, the one about the, secu the security dilemma, and in particular, 
the accumulation of capabilities that are meant to ensure that the system works in a way raises fears in the most sort of places whereby the very accumulation is supposed to prevent fears to come about. Um, so these are very uh, powerful uh, 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 factors, if you want, the powerful tensions that exist in international uh, relations. And definitely something that I personally enjoyed very much um, in reading the book, because at the very least, I remember as one of my mentors once said, um, any good book should do first and foremost one thing. And once you put it down, your mind is more open up towards new questions that you never imagined you'd have, uh, because that's the way how we move forward, uh, thinking and questioning the world that we take for granted. Um, Jennifer, what do you think of it? <laughs> So first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to join this great conversation. I want to thank Patrick for, for bringing me in on this uh, amazing project of his and uh, again for writing this book. This is, this is a, a real contribution as, as I'm going to uh, testify and I, I really think that it's a tremendous book. I, I highly recommend if, if people haven't for some reason, read it yet. Um, I guess on my side of the ocean, uh, it's not available yet. So to, to the Americans joining us, uh, get your name on that list because it is, it is well worth the read. <clears throat> so again, thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I just have a couple points to make and I really look forward to our conversation today. I think what, what Patrick's done here is, is a couple of things. So, so first, to, to let us know that an international order that has quite recently actually stylized itself as liberal has actually been quite illiberal in many ways. Uh, it's been illiberal in how the order was created, uh, requiring a lot in the way of the use of force, the use of coercion internationally, a lot of illiberalism domestically on the part of these dictators and, and some would say even within democracies. Um, so that all seems to be, if you're creating this order, it all seems to be contra the order's stated values and, and strikes us as this kind of end justifies the, the means sort of uh, pernicious logic. And then he's also saying it's illiberal in the, the maintenance of that order and indeed in the substance of the order in many ways. There's not as much free trade as we like to think of it. Uh, he talks about a return to mercantilism in recent years. Um, there's, again, a lot of coercion to, and this great quote that he found by Brzezinski, to keep the tributaries pliant and to subdue the barbarians, right? I mean, this is quite the language to be using in this like glowy uh, international order that, that we talk about today. So, um, so again, the, the, the order is not as liberal as we've been thinking. And then secondly, Pat has, has pointed out that the advocates of this order have, have created these very self-flattering narratives about it, and this kind of mythology about it. Uh, I study narratives, so I'm, I'm very interested in this aspect. Um, every entity needs a narrative, it, be it a person or a firm or a, a country, or indeed in this case, we're talking about an order. And it's fascinating to, to see, he's, he's kind of just below the surface of this, the scholars of narratives would, would love to, to work with us to talk about how the narrative was invented and reinvented over time. And, and the one he talks about is that, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's a very self-flattering narrative about the motivations of the order, and, and also it whitewashes over the failures of the order in, in pretty significant ways. And to the extent that the failures are, are discussed, the narrative seems to blame those failures on external forces. So it's never something related to the, the nature of the order <laughs> that went wrong. It was, we didn't try hard enough or, uh, you know, the, 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 we, we didn't believe enough or we didn't go as far as we needed to and so on. So the, again, the Iraq war is not seen as the logical product of the strategy of liberal hegemony, but rather it's seen as, oh, well, there was that weird Iraq war thing that happened, right? And what a blip that was. Uh, and then the US financial crisis and economic problems aren't blamed on that Iraq war, partly in the massive defense spending, um, but it's, it's 
it's mythologized that defense spending is being sustainable if you focus only on a small subset of its costs. And then I think Patrick does a great job pointing out the, the rise of Trump is not blamed on that Iraq war, on that financial crisis, um, but, but rather on, oh, it's, it's racism. We're all racist now. And, you know, I'm sure there is a lot of racism, but, but again, there was a lot of racism before. So, um, again, uh, the, the fact that there might be something to this uh, Trump platform simply that a bunch of deplorable people like it, right, um, that, that is not interrogated enough by either the proponents of the order or, or I would say even more broadly. So the, the order has profound illiberal means and in many ways some illiberal ends. And we've told ourselves a very happy story about this. Uh, this is a really big contribution that, that Patrick has made here. Uh, it's an important countervoice to that narrative, to that you know, uh, mythology, that, that gauzy sunshine and rainbows mythology that, that we invented. And uh, as an academic, I think our first job is to, to probe, to push, to, to ask ourselves, why do we think we know this? And when our friends say things that, that we think are dubious, it's the best thing we could possibly do for them and for the debate to say, hey, wait a minute, that sounds strange. And what about X? So, so that's our job as academics. And so, so I love it when I actually see uh, academics engaged in, and there's my cat and daughter. Uh, <laughs> I love it when I actually see academics engaged in the, the kind of policy relevant, uh, pugnacious kind of work that we're supposed to be doing rather than just sort of, you know, publishing yet another paper on, you know, 16 different lemmas associated with something. So, um, so again, the, what I think is a big contribution here, it, so I'll, I'll first say what I think Pat sees his contributions as, and I want to talk about that, and then I want to just say a couple added contributions that I see. Um, Patrick's identified one of the big implications, which is uh, linking the rise of Trump to this liberal order rather than seeing him as an aberration. Again, saying what has been the US political economic policy and security policy that might have given rise to this. Um, and, and again, I, I think he makes a great point about the fact that, you know, oh, you know, oh, it was just maybe it was Hillary Clinton's bad campaigning in Wisconsin and Minnesota, or, or you know, it was, oh, it was this freakish thing of there are these 80,000 voters in the swing states. The argument I always make is Trump should never have been nominated by a major party. That is the thing we have to explain. Um, how is it, let alone the Republican Party, uh, where he seems to have so little in common with the Republican Party. So, so that's what we would need to explain, not whether or not he won in that weird electoral landscape we have in American politics. But the fact that he was even nominated is something we have to answer for as a, as a republic. So, um, so I, again, one of these big contributions is, is linking the order and its policies and its failings to Trumpism, to the rise of Trump. And then I think Patrick identified at the beginning of his remarks today, the other key contribution uh, that he speaks of in his book, which is America at this moment is, is thinking about what should our future be in this new world that we're in, in this multipolar world of greater constraints. Um, I always laugh when I'm trying to figure out how to structure like a foreign affairs type essay, because in this moment in 2020, I want to say something like America's at a crossroads and all the, all the editors say, you can never say anything like that. It's such a cliche, but we are actually <laughs> maybe, maybe for the first time since 1945 at a crossroads and maybe it was so cliche before, but again, I think there's some deeper, link here to Patrick's arguments, but um, we really are at a crossroads. And so, uh, so Patrick is helping us 
as we're navigating this. He's saying, okay, we need to think about where we've been before we can think about where we're going. Um, so in the book, Patrick presents a pretty compelling uh, litany of, of criticisms about both the, uh, the illiberal motivations, the illiberal means, and then also the, the substance. So both how, why we wanted to create this order, how we did it, and then also the actual substance of the order not being as, as liberal and sunshine and rainbows as you know, we frequently say in this narrative. Um, and so the social scientist in me was thinking, gosh, I've, I've read so many articles by really smart people um, that just chose a different set of stylized facts, right? So, they, so if you read the, the essays by Eikenberry or Corey Shockey or you know, the people that Patrick cite, um, my colleagues here, uh, Steve Brooks and Bill Woolforth, um, they will come up with their own list of stylized facts that are all the achievements and the, the profound achievements of the international order. Um, again, the, the prosperity, the, the lack of great power war, and okay, maybe that's due to nuclear weapons, but is really that all it boiled down to? Um, you know, the democratization of these, these great nations, um, South Korea and Japan, yes, they, they went through this illiberal period, uh, yes, they were some of the biggest illiberal traders and so on, but traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. <laughs> I want to make sure in case the accent's getting in the way. Um, traders. Um, so again, somebody could write, well, they have written, and that's why Patrick wrote this book, the, the book saying the homage to all the achievements of the, the order. Um, and so then I thought, well, maybe what we need is we need like a, a more systematic way of kind of accounting. So going through and saying, what were the, the means? What were the goals? Um, and, and kind of coding them one way or another to, to try and really sort this out and say, okay, on balance, how do we judge this? Um, and I started to think though, at, at the end of the day, um, what if we did all that? And, and we said, okay, well, I think on balance it was 64% liberal. Um, how would we feel about that? And I don't think it would help us a whole lot analytically. And it wouldn't help us, as, as Patrick was saying, the whole point is to, to figure out how to move forward. So I, I don't actually think that would be so helpful. So, um, so again, the, just the fact that we're having this debate, I think, is, is really profound. Um, so I guess what I see is in terms of the most logical next step, the, the place to go, the, the, the kind of Patrick has given us this launching pad, where do we launch ourselves to? What, what should we be thinking about next? Um, I, I think what I think is, is it should be a wake up call to the political left. And we have seen the political left wake up. Uh, we've seen, you know, the, the rise of Bernie, we're feeling the burn. Uh, we've seen the, the rise of Elizabeth Warren. And we have seen the left push back against the failings of the, the international order, the liberal international order. And I, I think that what's notable is that we're finally seeing them wake up. Because basically, what we've seen is since the end of the Cold War, uh, the U.S. has had a very strange and, and arguably quite destructive political alliance in the realm of foreign policy between the political left and between the right. And I think that is what has enabled this, this kind of um, policies of liberal hegemony that we've seen. Um, and again, it, it dovetails well with, with Patrick's argument that this this creation of this order is really a post-1989 creation, that we didn't talk like this in the 50s, um, that, that we didn't act the way we're saying we acted in the 50s. So I think that in itself is a really important analytic contribution. And this argument that I'm making coincides with that, which is during the Cold War, we had the left 
hammering away at the right, saying, uh, here are all the excesses of your policies, too much defense spending, too many human rights violations, too much support for dictators. Um, and then you had the right hammering away <laughs> at the excesses of the left, right? Pointing out all the hypocrisy and their support for communist dictators like Castro and, and these sorts of things. So we had the left shouting at the streets at the right, talking about all the casualties in Vietnam and, and then vice versa, right? The, the, the right castigating the left for its failings. So um, what happened at the end of the Cold War, however, is we kind of lost this where we saw this, this alliance between the, the kind of neoliberal liberals and the, the neocons on the right. And this was new and this was different. And, and this is what allowed the policies of the, the, the kind of liberal hegemony kinds of policies, the emergence of American primacy rather than a return to a more multipolar world and so on. So, um, so I guess I would say that the result of that were some of the, the order's biggest failings, right? So the failure of the left to push back against the, the big giant projects of the neocons uh, led to some of its biggest failings, to NATO expansion, right? To, um, to bringing China into the order despite its domestic politics, despite its human rights problems, despite its mercantilism. Uh, and then of course the Iraq war, right? The, the left being complicit in that war when it should have been asking a lot tougher questions than it did. Um, now you might say, well, you're being really hard on the left here, right? What, I mean, this, this, these are the neocons projects. This is what they wanted to do. But that's just what neocons do, right? That's what they always do. They wanna build a huge military and they wanna use it to dominate, right? That's what they always wanna do. This is not what liberals generally sign on to. And it was this, um, again, we can talk about why this happened and maybe it was the kind of quick, easy victory over Iraq that led people to think that the use of force was, was a useful instrument and could be easily wielded and so on. Um, maybe it was problems in the electoral system where the, the, um, the, the, the left who was suffering weren't being heard, right? So we can talk about why this happened. But I really think that this was a, a key, a, this, this was a key fact that I really didn't think about until reading Patrick's book. And I think this is a really useful place to go next. I think it's an essential place to go next if you're the Democratic Party in an election year. Because if you're gonna keep blaming the rise of Trump on things unrelated to your policies for the, for the past 40 years, I think that's a big problem. You're not gonna fare well. Um, so it's important for, at least for that reason, and, and certainly for this, this kind of broader um, thinking about where we've been before we embark on a new, a new way of managing this multipolar order. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll close with is I had a lot of, of thoughts reading this book about the nature of foreign policy debates and how one nurtures a healthy foreign policy debate in an academic and policy community. Um, these debates can be quite closed off. Sometimes you can see areas where they, they are welcoming. Um, other times you can see areas where maybe we need to figure out events. And as academics, we can be part of this. We can figure out ways of, of bringing together people who aren't talking to one another enough. And, and Patrick and his great international security article, I think made another really good contribution in, in that respect, which is talking about just the very way that these conversations are held and the impact that they have on, on in this case, US grand strategy. So, uh, so again, reading this, this book makes one think, okay, well, why was the debate allowed to evolve in this way? And I, I've recently written a, a piece on um, 
the U.S. engagement strategy toward China and trying to evaluate how that debate was conducted and, of course, how what do we think of the outcomes such that we can say there is a, an outcome definitively. Um, and I, one thing I really noticed in those debates is people framed it as, well, it's engagement or containment, right? So, so, oh, well, of course we have to engage China because it would be folly to contain China. And what Patrick was just saying there and, and a minute ago, and then also what he says in his book, is the way that these choices like the Iraq war, like NATO expansion, all these different choices that were made during the, um, during the various decision points where we were growing or maintaining this order, is they were frequently framed in these kind of Manichaean ways. So is it engagement or isolationism? And I think that's one thing we can really do as academics and, and as just well-informed citizens is, is point out, maybe those aren't the choices. And I understand you're trying to drive the narrative by your use of framing those choices. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to accept them. So again, I want to say, Patrick, congratulations on an amazing achievement, which is not just you wrote a book and it was good, but this is, this is a contribution to the foreign policy of the U.S., of Britain, and, and to the countries that we, we care about and to the future discussions that we'll be having. So thank you. Thank you very much. Jennifer, thank you very much for um, your comments. Um, indeed, I think we've got now the ground set for a lovely conversation. Uh, let me just sort of try to summarize uh, 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 Jennifer's uh, comments. I think three main line of thoughts. Um, first, the fact that we often talk about being a crosswords in, in international relations, but perhaps right now we are. And whether Trump is a product or indeed a driver behind it, uh, the key thing is what do we do uh, from, from here? And so there is a, a, a link between this type of comment and the timely nature of Patrick's book as, as someone is putting himself out there saying like, look, uh, this is the situation, it's a very complicated situation, but if we really want to engage on how to move forward, we really must understand what we mean by shorthands that we use every day because otherwise we're going to get lost in the process. And I think that is a very important thing. Um, I think I lost count of the numbers of conferences and, and, and seminars whereby there was always the quip about the rule-based order or the international order, at which point you turn around and say, like, okay, what did they mean by that, right? So, so there is an element of that we all use certain sort of expressions, but we don't spend enough time to clarify where they come from, or what they actually mean and what we want them to mean. The second point that I think was very, very important that you highlighted, and, and in a way it's very refreshing, right? Uh, it's the question of the convergence in the political debate domestically in the United States between the left and the right, in many respects. We tend very often to talk uh, about the importance of domestic political debates when it comes, to, you know, we talk about China, right? How Chinese foreign policy is in a way ancillary and prisoner of domestic sort of uh, uh, requirements um, in, in the country and uh, the party. But guess what? We could make an argument, and I think the, the point you were making about Patrick's book is that it kind of makes us think about the fact that perhaps that's also what has happened in the United States uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the sort of this new hegemonic period, whereby perhaps the atrophy, right, the, in terms of the ideas that we're playing with, is the result of a convergence in a political debate whereby sort of the lack of, of more stronger positions prevented articulated policies to be sort of the natural result of it. And then the third point that you raised about how we debate, how did we get here, right? How that debate sort of uh, land us where we are today. And in a way, it's about the mechanics. It's not just about the convergence, but also the mechanics. It's incredible, isn't it? In, a, in, in the 2020, with all the means of the communications, all the journals, uh, peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed that we have hanging about, the amount of information that we process, we seem to be incapable to actually make a dent on having a constructing conversation, right? As if like too many voices prevented us from playing music and being an orchestra, but becoming basically over layers of, of noise um, all around. So I think both in terms of the book and the commentary, we've got a fantastic sort of setup. And I have to say, I'm happy to report that we already have quite a few questions. So bear with me um, because we've got quite um, 
uh, quite a few interesting points raised. I want to start with a question asked by um, uh, Cornelia Adriania uh, Basu, uh, John Hopkins, um, who um, asked uh, three sort of quite compact, intense questions that unfolded from one of the points that, that Patrick was making in the beginning. Um, last Thursday, Donald Trump's arms control negotiator said that the US is prepared to overspend China and Russia into oblivion. Right. Um, so questions for uh, Patrick and of course, Jennifer, please do jump in if, if you have any thoughts about this as well. Uh, from a domestic factors perspective, can the US afford to pursue a nuclear arms race? And this is a point that you both sort of mentioned in, in the comments. But the second related question, uh, is great power competition prompting, prompting the US to adopt a one war grand strategy? And if that's the case, where does that leave the United States allies? For example, what European grand strategy should be about within this great power competition. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a couple of excellent questions to start off with. I've got a few others. So if I could ask you to sort of to keep the answers short and sharp so that we can stay punchy uh, side of the life. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jennifer, as well. There's some, there's some really stimulating things that I have to go away and sleep on and think about. And kind of <laughs> that it's, it's, it's been really, uh, very fruitful. So the question of arms control and nuclear testing. I think first of all, uh, I felt when I saw that there'd been this dalliance with the idea of actually detonating, doing a nuclear test to 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 impress China and the abrogation of, of arms control treaties, we'd entered the third term of the Bush administration. Because the, there was, in a less dramatic way, the Bush two administration had begun uh, the ballistic missile uh, treaty, for instance, um, there'd been a, a tilt towards a kind of loosening of restraint and unilateralism then as well. I think one of the problems with being a hegemon uh, is that it's very easy for predominance and competition to become the end and not the means, that, that we forget the purpose of American foreign policy. Is the purpose of American foreign policy for America to be predominant as an end in itself, or is that a means to something else? And there's, this becomes very dangerous because if you start to believe that the purpose is to be dominant as an end in itself, then everything ex is expendable for that outcome. Uh, resources are expendable, uh, secure, secure debt, social security expendable, the constitution becomes expendable because you create an imperial presidency that shouldn't be tied down by congressional oversight, etc. I think it's also very dangerous because uh, quite aside from anything else, I think there is a real long-term problem here of inadvertently driving Russia and China together. Uh, in other words, one of the purposes of American grand strategy is supposed to be to keep Eurasia divided so that there isn't a, a grand opponent uh, uniting that sort of continent uh, menacing the United States. Well, one problem here is that for all their differences, Moscow and Beijing are seeing a lot to unite against. I mean, it's, it's a slow motion process, but I think it is underway. So it could have that effect as well. I think it also will become very expensive. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't forget the whole problem of, of debt and indebtedness. So I'll stop my Grim Reaper act there. Let me unmute Mr. Jennifer, would you like to add anything more on this? Particularly on the um, nuclear, uh, yeah, I've, question. On the, uh, the nuclear angle, I, I think that's a really important point that Patrick just made in terms of um, the, well, <laughs> we need a grand strategy. Like, first of all, we need to know where we're going. And, and then the nuclear policy should follow from that, right? So, so Patrick was saying, uh, in a strategy, if, if your strategy is to divide Russia and China, mm. then this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so, so again, it's, it's, we need to figure out, well, what, what is the U.S. strategy? And, and strategy doesn't seem to be the strong suit of this administration, <laughs> um, which, which seems to, again, it's, it's more power being an end in itself, it's a lot of signaling, it's a lot of posturing and so on. So, um, but, but in terms of what the strategy is, like why would that say we should have another nuclear test or, or be buying 
more nuclear weapons. And the, the question is, is what kind of nuclear weapons, mm. right? I mean, so you don't just buy a bunch more stuff, right? I mean, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe you do, but um, I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't there be a, a mission that these are linked to and that mission is linked to a strategy? So um, on that, uh, I, I would agree that if, if and I've, as Patrick pointed out, I've, I've said that our strategy should, should be thinking about ways to divide Russia and China, that this would definitely not be helpful toward that. And, and with respect to the, the question about the allies, uh, if, if the U.S. Is, is, is in fact pursuing a one war strategy, um, for, again, we need to figure out what is actually the case. Um, are they or, or aren't they? Um, one, one thing that I can tell you Americans get kind of frustrated about, or at least I do, is we are simultaneously being told we're withdrawing while we are simultaneously still on the hook to defend everyone. And that doesn't feel right, <laughs> right? It's like, if you're gonna withdraw, then take the criticism and, and take the effects of that, but at least you're safer, um, or uh, be all in and, and, and you get the deterrence value of that and whatever. So, so again, we're in this weird world where the, the punditry keeps saying we're both. And that's it's kind of frustrating <laughs> because uh, if, if you're trying to promote American security, it's like, well, figure out what's your theory of that. It's either by being engaged or, or not engaged in some places and, and carry that out. But in terms of this, I, I mean, the, the allies need to have real conversations amongst themselves about what do you think threatens you? Uh, there's, there's huge divisions in Europe over this, over whether Russia is indeed a threat. Mm. And you, you see that division pretty profoundly. In East Asia, there's big divisions over the extent to which China is seen as a threat. And this is really evolving very quickly. Um, Australia is only fairly recently thinking about China in, in the increasingly threatening terms. Um, the Philippines used to be one of the countries that I would talk about as being um, more inclined toward balancing against China, and that's completely under Duterte, um, seen a reversal. So, so again, there's the, the allies need to figure out who do we think, are, what are our security threats, and how should we best meet those threats. And, and some countries are doing a better job of this rather than others. Some countries are, are sort of putting their head in the sand and saying, well, we'll just hope the Americans sort this out. And, and again, you can do that. And I, I wouldn't if I were you. <laughs> uh, read the Pat Porter book and, and uh, it makes you a little worried about the state of the debate here. And so I think the allies really do need to have a, a much tougher inward looking conversation uh, and uh, spoiler alert, you're gonna have to spend more than 1% of GDP on defense. So um, I'll leave it at that. Wonderful, I have to say, we, we, we're having now built up quite, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit of questions. And um, so I'll, I'll try to sort of in, in some cases to group them because some of them are quite similar. But I want to start uh, with one that was put on early. I don't know about the both of you, but one of the greatest sort of rewards of our job is when you're sitting in class and the least unexpected question, which is also one of the most pointed ones you'll ever get, comes from one of your students. And um, so I'm happy to report that there's a former student of Patrick who was actually asked quite a pointed question. Um, Okay, so halfway, he's halfway through his book, your book already. Good. Um, and um, there is a contradiction, an errant contradiction with the um, liberal order. And he bought that. However, he's asking a very a good question. Should countries drop the rhetoric and pursue their interests nakedly or act in, li act in line with the international rules, accepting the constraints as well as the actions of the rule breakers? What is the alternative if this liberal order is not that liberal after all? So that's a splendid question. And my answer is that actually it's not so much what you outwardly say, it's what you think you're doing. And my worry is that there is a, a lack of clarity in this thought process, in this nostalgia, in this kind of mytho history. But I think that one of the one of the difficulties of the international system being a tragic place is that there is a necessary element of hypocrisy. Because um, it's very difficult, like in normal life, it's very difficult to actually be consistent. I mean, the person who is hypocritical about their lifestyle 
might be unbearable, but not nearly as unbearable as the person who is utterly consistent in everything they do. And I think that there, there are there there are there is deception, uh, there is uh, double standards. I do think we need to have a tighter relationship between words and deeds. For instance, mm. if Britain is if Britain and America are going to talk very hard about liberal rules and order in Asia, then they need to think very carefully about the status of citizens in Diego Garcia and in many of the disenfranchised populations, the people who are on the receiving end in the 1950s of nuclear tests. Um, there's going to have to be some give and take there. For instance, I for instance, I would say, um, don't just give away Diego Garcia, which I seem to be obsessed with, but try and strike some kind of settlement whereby people get most of the justice and most of the territory back, whilst also somehow retaining a base there. But don't just say say A and 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 act X, because people are noticing and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt one's interests. May I also say, actually, this raises a second point. Um, and I did really wanted to rush to agree with something Jenny said, but really important. This is as much a reproach to allies as it is to the United States in thinking mm. about the past. Uh, there are some very hard choices to make. America, Australian politicians ran around for a decade saying very nervously, we don't have to choose between Beijing and Washington. We don't have to choose. Well, guess what? You may actually end up having to choose because Beijing and Washington also have a major say in that proposition. Now, you can choose uh, to carry on uh, uh, taking the risk of very low, historically low defence spending and hoping for the best. You can choose to bandwagon with China. You can choose to stick with the American alliance and spend more on defence. Each of those has trade-offs. Each of those has costs. But the choice itself cannot be ducked. And it's this, what I'm trying to get at here is this kind of false consciousness that if we tell America enough that we've been their friend or mate, to use the unctuous term, for, for 70 years, they'll, they'll behave like they always have. Well, actually, one of, the, one of the points of international history is that sometimes even the best allies just don't turn up. I think that's, that's, that's a very important point you're making. That perhaps, you know, Southeast Asia is a very good case, uh, a good example of this, right? The idea, don't make us make a choice. Well, it might actually have to happen at some point, whether you like it or not. Um, we have a, a few other questions that actually are related to this topic, um, particularly in terms of uh, uh, something that, that, that Jennifer was raising earlier on, um, on the matter of domestic politics. Uh, do you both believe that unipolarity and the lack of, 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 a, of a rival in the hegemonic sense um, is, um, has made sort of uh, American foreign policy more open to be influenced and informed by domestic variables rather than, than structural constraints? And if that's the case, is COVID-19 uh, more likely to reduce or increase and enhance the situation or indeed that did not have any impact at all um, and related to this um, a, a, a similar question about u.s foreign policy um, if the uh, project sort of the liberal project is, is not possible to be pursued uh, what is the alternative um, what does a reasonable u.s foreign policy look like uh, where we can uphold our values, but also not lend the massive support to dictators and illiberal rulers. So two sort of uh, questions focusing on this relationship between domestic and foreign policy, but also values and foreign policy. How do we relate to them? Uh, Jennifer, do you want to start giving a, a, a bit of a stab at this and then we'll get back in with, Paul, with, with Patrick? Sure. Um, so on the question of under unipolarity, did we see domestic forces kind of in the driver's seat of US foreign policy? Um, it's possible, but, but when I think about the, the big change in polarity and the changes that we've been talking about today in, in US foreign policy, the changes that, that Patrick talks about in his book where he talks about, um, we went from a, uh, a, a international capital market where capital would move about the world, but then over time this this became this huge, much more open, unfettered system than we had seen before. Um, also the, the growth of the human rights regime, uh, which used to be bounded by uh, sovereignty norms, right? Where, where you would say, okay, well, of course, every government has the right to connect itself within its own borders. 
in the way that it feels necessary and chooses according to its values and needs. Uh, that used to be how we would, would look at human rights. Uh, but then after the end of the Cold War, we said, wait a minute, well, maybe we could even help people within these borders that, that need our help. So we see this massive growth in ambition in terms of what the, the, the advocates of the liberal order, uh, the, the order, uh, saw, saw themselves as, as, um, as wanting to do, wanting to achieve. And, and what happened there, what, what changed? Well, it was polarity, right? It was, it was the, this is what John Mearsheimer talks about when he says, uh, if, you, if you have a regional hegemon with the freedom to roam, right? The, it's in this menacing phrase that he uses. Uh, we had freedom to roam, and so we roamed. And the big change that happened that allowed that was the structure of the international system. And it might be also that where we roamed and how we roamed was, was influenced by domestic considerations. But um, I see the main thing there as being structural. And the main changes now as being, uh, as being structural, but also the, the reality of domestic politics is, is you just can't deny. Um, the, the people who have lost out from free trade, um, not being compensated, as the, the economists tell you on the first day of class when you take free trade 101, which is that there are losses from free trade and you have to compensate to the people who lose out. So we ignored that. And, and, and so there are these huge losses borne by um, some people in the country, but, but uh, huge gains enjoyed by others. And so obviously that's having very important domestic political effects. Um, the, the other question, and I, I think we should poke into this more, and I'll just kind of say a couple words, is on, uh, if not the liberal international order, what, what's the alternative? And, and I think that Patrick says this very well, where he says, you know, I, I think he wants a liberal international order. I'm not, I don't think he says I want to, you know, create this authoritarian system. He just, he just says we should be cognizant of, uh, as we're saying what our goals are, we should be cognizant that what are the methods we're using to achieve those goals? Uh, and are those, in fact, our goals? When we look around us today, do we say, this is, this is the kind of liberal that we meant? So absolutely, we could point to, and he does this a little bit in the book, and I would love to see the book inspire more people to think about these things. Like he, he talks about you know, a, a Chinese-led international order would be very different. Um, it would be fascinating to think about would it be more bloody or less bloody? And I'm not sure, because again, you have the crusading liberalism on the liberal order side, and then you have the, the Chinese side, which is non-intervention, which of course they mean in very different ways than just never intervening. But um, so theirs would be, I'm guessing, internally quite repressive. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating thought experiment to think like, um, would they get into the same number of adventures? So um, it's hard to say. But um, then uh, Patrick also talked about the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, to, to speak again of propaganda and how people name their orders. And, and so we have a feeling that that would have been a pretty brutal one. And so there's an interesting thought experiment to comparing the, the order of today uh, to these previous orders or to would-be orders in the future. And I think that's a, a really interesting direction for the conversation to go. Just very, two very quick points to build on that. Uh, first of all, the question of what is the alternative? I actually would counsel uh, a much more minimal response about actually dialing down the grandiose demand for a single world order of anything. Let's begin with the common thing, which is the desire not to have a major war, right? Because I think that's a value as well. Peace as well is, or the absence of major war is a value, right? It's not just an interest. And there are things the US can do to promote that, um, an end to adventures in regime change, a return to arms control. 
um, a degree of um, acceptance and tolerance of some things that it doesn't necessarily like. There will be some uh, spheres operating where there's some behavior that offends us all. Uh, but within that, I think the US can do an important thing, which is instead of talking all the time about doing, think about being, being a republic that's a powerful example right? Because that's also a strong tradition within the US, a strong strand within the US tradition, thinking about being a beacon and doing something at home, doing something at home about that, about limited government, about building a kind of better civic uh, model that others can look to to emulate. Um, the, the purpose of American foreign policy, I would argue, at least the best version of that, is how can it produce this sustained experiment in Republican government in a very hostile world. And it's going to be a world of multiplicity. It's going to be a world in which there isn't a single hegemon setting the terms anywhere. And one of the problems is the US is in the habit of thinking about a monochrome, one-dimensional international system dominated by somebody. The discipline's going to have to be accepting multiplicity, accepting those contradictions. Uh, and uh, Therefore, something that actually goes for stability and coexistence more than transformation, um, in the hope that others can converge on their own terms in the long run. But And then that, this brings to the final point, is what do we think will happen now that the structural pressures are getting worse? I'm actually more pessimistic. I think there's something about hegemons where once their mythology uh, takes hold, it's very difficult for them to abandon that narcissism. This is not peculiar to America. The Ottoman Empire, a number of a number of powers have died hard with their belief about themselves that they have somehow cracked the code and are special and singular and appointed by history, or in Madeleine Albright's words, we see further, we are clairvoyant. I think it's very hard to let that go. And we thought the global financial crisis and the disasters of the war on terror would actually be a, a lesson in the limits of power. It turns out they weren't. I thank you. I mean, this this the conversation is 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 is, is sort of continuously bringing up new, very important threads. And um, as you were both discussing, um, I think uh, East Asia is an interesting case. Uh, Jennifer's point about the core prosperity sphere uh, of the past as a failed orderly project, as much as a potentially imagined uh, Chinese or, or, or order. Uh, of course, uh, one of the things that we should probably uh, start re-engaging with is the problem of geography and international politics as in like that how we conceptualize space and how space affects what we can and, and cannot do of course east asia having one large continental state predominantly and then dotted by uh, surrounding states all divided by the oceans makes the question of overseas projection uh, a choice that needs to be matched up by investment, sustainability, questions that, of course, in different types of systems. And let's not forget that the United States in 1945 does not have to make that important choice uh, because it is through overwhelming sea power that has managed to win the war. So at that point, the sort of how do I get to have that worldwide global projection? It's not a question that people are asking. People are asking the question, should we keep it or should, get, should we get rid of it? Um, and I think that's, that's, that's again, an, 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 a new element to this story. And the point you were making, so important to re-emphasize that perhaps the question is not that there is no international order, but there are international orders depending on the particular aspect of international politics we'll talk about. As a maritime expert, I would say there is a question of power and legitimacy that comes in the maritime order because there are legal frameworks that constrain superpowers and in fact force superpowers to acquire a degree of legitimacy in their actions for their role as a hegemon not to be entirely rejected. So again, very important points that you're striking uh, there. I have a few questions left here and I want to get sort of quite quickly to them. I'll start with a couple of questions that are related to the points that we were just making because uh, they, they kind of present some interesting um, counterpoints. One, um, Christopher is asking, pa Patrick, would you modify your thesis if the US and to a certain extent the UK had been more cautious in using military power and indeed um, had a, any recognizable strategy for their engagements. Related to this, somewhat slightly, slightly more perhaps on a pessimistic tone, is there no end to 
US overseas commitments in, engendered from uh, the 9-11 uh, effects. Um, is this mythology going to keep the United States prisoners of everlasting uh, engagements in uh, Middle East, North Africa, uh, and Southeast Asia? Um, and lastly, Jennifer, I think this point goes back to something that you mentioned earlier on um, about um, how, you know, where, the, where are we coming from and the, the role of history and understanding with narratives as they, as they historically develop uh, in a way is an important way to understand where we're going. And, and there's a question here from William um, about uh, the point that if one looks at all sort of British um, official documents, FCO, um, cabinet office documents from the Cold War, the closest you get to uh, a common shorthand that is similar to rule-based international order is um, the free world, right? And it's used over and over again, and it kind of like made sense to an extent. Do you think that um, an international liberal order uh, requires an opponent in order for remaining sort of coherent not just as because we have an opponent who we can sort of identify ourselves in opposition to it, but because that opposition creates a tension that allows for debates for, to produce better policy. Um, Patrick, can I go back to you first and then, and then while, while Jennifer is, is sort of uh, 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 coming together with uh, her own thoughts on this? Yeah, so uh, in, in a word, yes. If had there been more restraint for the past three or four decades, I probably would have written a different book, but that's a very big if. It's a bit like saying Switzerland without mountains. Well, yes, it wouldn't be a different country, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miracle world counterfactual we're talking about here. I think um, what I probably should stress is that as a, as a sort of attempting to be a Machiavellian type realist, um, I'm not advocating for a kind of international order without coercion, without military force. In fact, I do make a case for a modified balancing against China hopefully one that avoids a major war, but I do think there is there are other things at play that are, that are at stake. And there is there does need to be, at times, quite serious coercion and actually betrayals and terrible things that you wouldn't do in your private life. But that's the whole essence of Machiavellian realism, that there is a different and dual morality. For instance, I mean, I don't, don't advocate everything, but Churchill sinking the Vichy fleet when the, the uh, crews refused to come out of their ships for fear that that fleet could be handed over to Nazi Germany, for instance, right? Uh, in, what in private life would be murder, in public life, part of a supreme national emergency. The, the point about morality, which someone else raised before, is it's, it's identifying the point of necessity versus the point of excess, right? Because in Machiavelli's tradition, ex excessive misbehavior, which is unnecessary for reason of state, is, where, is, also, is, is just as much of a wrong as passive uh, naivety. Um, but on the question of uh, frequency of military action, there actually, if you read the New York Times in 2002, there was, a op there, was a, there was an advertisement taken out by a number of mostly US scholars, mostly realists, saying we live in a world uh, of resistance. We live in a world of nationalism. We live in a world where people tend not to like military occupations. And if you occupy Iraq, there will be bloody resistance. Uh, I wish that had been heeded. That's, sorry, that's, that's the end of my answer. In terms of, I just wanted to comment on this, the rules-based international order rhetoric, which keeps coming up again and again. Uh, and, and this question that was raised in terms of, do we need an opponent? And is, is that the, the kind of rhetorical device that sustains the order? Um, so the first thing I, I think, I mean, that's a very interesting thought if we're talking about how narratives evolve and, and which narratives are successful. Um, the, the time of the early 1990s is a really fascinating time to think about in terms of the, the US casting about for trying to figure out, okay, what are we doing? And, and if we have chosen to still remain very powerful and not draw down to the extent that we might have, to, to keep lots of guns and, and not do quite as much butter as we, we could. Why, right? Like what, what are the dragons that we feel we need to slay? So the, the early 1990s is a really fascinating time. Um, 
that was right around the same time that the China threat narratives began. And, and a lot of people talk about the, um, that as being, well, this is, you know, this is the um, bureaucracy casting about for a villain. Um, this, is, this is racism. And, and of course, you can, you can talk about elements of, of both of those things. Um, but if, if you start looking at the growth of Chinese power, that's really when it started taking off. And uh, as a result, again, of a lot of the decisions made within the, the, the international order to bring China into various institutions to normalize relations and so on. So um, today, I, I guess I would say we shouldn't think about like, oh, we're, we're trying to cast about for opponents. I mean, we have an opponent. Um, I don't like to say it in these kind of stark, uh, you know, wrestling match terms, but if we're talking about, is there an alternative to the international order that we've seen over the past 40 or so years? Um, we debated for a while if in fact, China was going to offer an alternative. That was a big debate in international relations scholarship. It was a very lively debate. And one side has definitively lost. And that's, that's one thing that we actually need to have an accounting of. China is here and China has no intention of accepting the status quo of many aspects of the international order. And talk about the need for an accounting. Uh, this was a lively debate in IR and we need to revisit that fact and we need to take stock of, of um, okay, 30 years later, what have we learned? So China is presenting an alternative. And for, for a lot of the people who talk about, oh, well, China doesn't have any soft power and who's going to follow China, I would say quite a few countries that have been quite aggrieved by this, quote, liberal order that, that Patrick has, has been writing about. So, um, so A, we have an alternative. This is not a rhetorical construct. And, and B, um, there are quite a few countries in the world that are going to find it a very appealing alternative. And so, uh, again, the, the question is probably going to shift to one of domestic politics, this time in China, which is China clearly already has the power to mount a challenge uh, to U.S. leadership, at least in Asia. And actually, we're seeing beyond also in terms of diplomatically, politically, and economically. Militarily, we're not sure if they're so interested, but absolutely in those other realms. So um, absolutely, the, the international order, as we have seen it for the past 40 or so years, is facing a challenge. I think another important point that comes out of Patrick's work that actually dovetails really well with my, my essay with Bill Woolforth in Foreign Affairs, um, I guess last spring, um, which is to point out this difference between the 1945 to 1989 and then the post-1989. And Bill and I made the point of the alternative to the order we have today is to return to a previous, more restrained version of what we see today. And so, um, so that's also an alternative. It's not only the Chinese are the alternative or the, you know, the, the rise of whoever is an alternative. Uh, we have a, a different way that we comported ourselves during the Cold War. And I'm not saying go back to <laughs> supporting dictators or, or certain dictators, we're still supporting them, obviously. But, um, but, but are there things, are there insights that we can, we can glean from the way, the, the level of ambitions that we adopted during the Cold War as opposed to after? Wonderful. Um, on this particular point of uh, um, alternatives, there was another question asked about whether the decline of liberal international order, um, whether it ever existed or not, but this, at the very least, the perception that is being more fragmented and that under sort of with the US leadership being under strain, um, how do you see uh, as a possible alternative the rise of fragmentation of the international system into small regional systems that are 
interconnected, but in terms of policy and security are much more self-contained and, and therefore a much more fragment, fragmented international relations society. Patrick, for you, yes. Is this, this is a question, oh, sorry. Um, I think that's already underway, uh, but I also think the US will not go quietly into the night and accept that fragmentation. So on the, on the one hand, there is this system-wide development, should we say, uh, where the world in a sense is getting larger, harder to conquer, harder to govern, harder for any one power to dominate. In fact, if anything, we've got to get out of the habit of thinking about the world as a place fit for one power to, to order at all, right? Uh, but on the other hand, the US is going to keep, the US and China will, will continue to try and intrude. And I agree with Jennifer, there is, there is a danger that some, that some in China's orbit will be tempted to bandwagon, which I think is one reason for the US to stay in Asia, at least, if not to dominate, at least to, to provide some equilibrium. And that's all, that's much easier said than done. Uh, but one of the problems, I think, and this is where we get back to the issue of how you remember the past, is that, and we've mentioned this already, the US rise to power was extraordinary and unusual and precipitate and relatively low cost, not low cost for those who died in World War II, but relative to every other power that's risen. It was a sudden, relatively, relatively inexpensive rise. And which almost artificial disparity in power to the point, if you look, if you compare the relative GDP of the world of the US held in 1960 and now, and yet the US continues to judge itself by that, um, by that atypical standard mm. of, of power. In fact, no power on earth can sustain that level of expectation. So in other words, the US in a strange sort of way is cursed by its good fortune, that it rose to power in a way that made it feel like this should be the natural state of affairs. Mm. So I think that's, Yet another reason for scholars to do what they can to kind of probe and pick away like sort of woodpeckers. Now, I am conscious of the time and I'm afraid that we probably will have to draw it to an end very uh, soon. Um, there are a couple of questions out there on, on, on specific issues, whether you touch them or not on the book. And uh, for the moment, what I'll do, I'll just suggest that you actually buy the book and, and you see if they're in there. Uh, and, and instead, choose just one last question because it, it, it's closer to home. And in a way, um, it makes us also, it connects it to the timely nature of the debate today you want us to join. Um, it really has to do with the current um, integrated review in the UK. What are the key issues you think um, this review should seek to tackle um, in light of the conclusions that you draw um, in your book? I think uh, what kind of power Britain wants to be in the world uh, the question of identity is, it looms large and it's almost obsessional over here. But I think as much as what I'd say to Australia, which is what are the actual hard choices in front of us? Um, does, does Britain want to be a leading power in NATO, in which, it's going to, in which case it's going to have to spend some pounds, in which it's going to have to start debating something which we're not debating, which is tax, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, the, these capabilities are not cheap. And uh, there's a lot of, the, the fact is that thanks, thanks partly to the order that we've received, there is an enormous amount of hoarded untaxed wealth that I think needs to be taxed, need, needs to needs to be mobilized by the state, right? So that's the kind of the egalitarian part of the argument here, that the order has been inegalitarian in its effects. And as a result, the tax receipts aren't there to produce the kind of capabilities to defend NATO's eastern flank, et cetera. So it's, we're gonna to have to talk about money and we're gonna to have to talk about tax. A, a, a series of things we actually don't like debating. We like to debate in a kind of low tax, deregulated framework. Actually, I think we need to go the opposite of that. And I think also just in terms of uh, clo even closer to home, uh, actually thinking harder about reindustrializing, bringing back the nuclear scientific base to the country. Again, it's a matter of money. But doing that without actually, without falling prey to the temptation of Beijing seizing coercive control over British infrastructure. So all of these questions about capacity and diplomatic relationships will come together, but it's going to have to be an exercise where it goes beyond just signalling to other powers that we have a security strategy review, actually reviewing the really difficult choices. I'm not, I'm, I'm willing to be persuaded that that's what we're going to do, but I think it's, I think it's very difficult. 
Patrick, um, I, I think this is a wonderful note to end our conversation um, on. Uh, but Jennifer, would you like to add anything else, and perhaps from the perspective of the United States, um, looking outwardly, what do you see uh, in the world? And in a way, based on what Patrick is telling us about the international order, what do you think the challenges are, uh, are for the United States, especially now that we're about to enter a sort of uh, 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 electoral, electoral, electoral season, as it were? Well, I, I think that as we discussed before, this, this is really a momentous time. Uh, we're talking about the rise of a peer competitor, as the IR wonks like to say it, uh, the rise of a superpower in another region in which the US has traditionally exercised a great deal of dominance. And so this is a, a sea change. This is a, a big moment. And so thinking about uh, I, I, that's why I think Patrick's book is so, such an amazing resource at this time is because we can think about the last time we were trying to deal with a, a, a peer competitor across the world. Uh, what did we do? What did we say we were doing? <laughs> uh, how did we do it? Uh, this is such a great moment to interrogate all that as we, as we turn our, our focus toward this, this to, toward Asia and toward China. And, and I, I think also this is, a, this is a vexing time for the US and its European allies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the Asian allies as well, but uh, just how do we deal with the fact that the biggest security concern to the United States is China? And from what we're seeing and from what I can tell when I'm visiting Europe and, and talking to the, the wonderful foreign policy community folks like yourselves there, China is not the biggest concern. Uh, Asia is not the biggest concern. And so that is a troubling reality that we're seeing such a divergence in our perceptions. And we could talk about, is that divergence narrowing? Are we seeing greater convergence on that point? Um, and, and how is that going to evolve as we go forward? But I, I think that is a, a, a profound change that, that we're, we're thinking of. It doesn't mean the U.S. is no longer interested in Europe. It doesn't mean that, I mean, obviously Russia is, is, is quite uh, troublesome these days too from Washington's standpoint. So it's not that we're disinterested in Europe, but just the, the issue of uh, if the U.S. fundamental security challenge is in Asia, and if Europe is not particularly interested in that challenge, I think that is uh, that is both does not bode well for the the health of the the future transatlantic relationship. And so, this is something we should be thinking about: how are we going to manage? Well, thank you very much, both for what has been an absolutely delightful conversation. Um, it, this this is incredible, um, and above all, it reminds me. Uh, that uh, indeed we started with a slightly somber note, but we ended with a very positive note uh, because we now know that no matter what the problems of the world are, a good starting point is always an excellent book in your hand. And so it happens that this one is just one click away on Amazon, uh, whichever platform you're using. Thank you both very much for this conversation. Thank you all those who contributed with questions so to keep the debate uh, lively and animated. Um, and of course, for those who weren't um, able to get an answer, uh, some of the answers you find them uh, in the book themselves. And Patrick uh, is always uh, open to have conversations about international politics that i can tell you for sure one of the greatest companions that all repined which this time won't have an opportunity to share but nonetheless i look forward to hosting you both uh, again very soon in the meantime stay safe thank you very much everyone for joining us thank, thank you, you so much thank, thank you. you thank you jenny thank you alessio thank you thank you guys bye-bye bye-bye thank you so much <laughs>